All right. Hey, thanks for joining us again for another episode of Triple Play. We appreciate you guys uh, showing up each week and listening on uh, to us. Um, and don't forget to support those who support us. Uh, Resource One, Andy McCollum. Uh, man, we're blessed by his friendship and uh, their support. Uh, you can give them a, those guys a call at 636-458-1798. Also, CS Design, uh, you can get a hold of our man Chris. He did the intro, the outro. Um Gosh, our website, if you uh, haven't been to that, check it out. We got the merch. I've got my uh, shirt on today. So we, we got all sorts of cool stuff out there. So feel free to uh, get stuff that all helps support us. And you can call Chris to support him at 573-436-3717. And the website is tripleplaylife.com. And, uh, hey, we hope you guys uh, enjoy this episode. You'll notice today that I'm missing my, my co-host, um, he had a, a couple things going on today, so we are blessed to have uh, Blaker filling in today. Um, Blake is going to, to uh, pinch hit for Scott today, so we're excited about that. And uh, it's going to make this discussion really cool because we got a great guest today. Our guest today is Jerry Marshall. He's been my pastor for uh, quite some time now, um, and we've grown a cool friendship, uh, um, and uh, uh, whether he considers it or not, I consider it a mentorship. I know I can go to him whenever I have a biblical question. He's great to answer these questions. Um, we're going into Easter weekend, and who better to have break down God's Word and talk to us a little bit about the significance of Easter than, than Jerry, Jerry Marshall. So, um, And uh, we're going to have a great time with this. Jerry, for those who don't know, is a graduate of Moody Bible Institute, a pretty well known Bible Institute uh, and uh, Trinity College. Um, you also attended Trinity Seminary. Is that what I read? Correct. Okay. And uh, uh, and so uh, definitely got a, the, the, the pedigree there. I would say even more probably, in my opinion, significant than those are the fact that you've sat underneath the teachings of John MacArthur for a long time, yeah. whether it be going to the Shepherd Seminars or listening to his sermons. And I know that you've built a friendship with him over the years um, as well. And, uh, and those things, I think, are meaningful. I mean, you know, you can come out of Bible college or seminary. I went to Bible college, and there are a lot of people that come out with all sorts of different views, and and not a, and many of them can be incorrect. But having people you can go to to to, to help point you to God's word and the truth in such a loving way. Um, and John MacArthur is one of those people that I look up to. Another guy, he probably doesn't know that he's a mentor of a guy in St. Louis named Josh, but. Um, I, I, you know, I fell in love. I, when I worked at the Baptist bookstore, I would look through all these commentaries and his were first, were just coming out at that time. He had probably put out like the first five or six. And I immediately just started, I liked them better than the Wearsby's or all the other ones that would be in there. I mean, they had all the, all the various top ones that were out there. Yeah. Um, but, and so over the years I started collecting, uh, his, his, and then I started listening to his sermons online and uh, and so I'm sure like many other people that he'll never know or meet, uh, he's been a mentor to many, many of us. So, um, But I'm excited, not not for John MacArthur, but to have Jerry Marshall today <laughs> So on our episode. Mm -hmm. And with that, why don't you give us a little bit about your background? How did you come to know Christ and, uh, and, and your passion for God's Word? So That's kind of an interesting but long story, so I'll make it short. No, you so can, we have enough we got, time? Oh, we got as much time as God allows and you, and, and, and you have, so... Yeah, when I was uh, a young man, you know, in my late teens, early 20s, one of my um, passions or desires was to become a professional musician. Mm. And I achieved the goal when I was 20 years old. I was able to sign on with a very, very excellent musical group in the city of Chicago um, and played with them for a couple of years. Uh, the problem was in the passing of time, I suffered from what I call um, a destination sickness. Mm. In other words, I achieved the goal. I arrived at the destiny mm. that I was aiming at, but I was left empty. Mm. And I thought it would be fulfilling. I thought it would be perpetually um, peaceful and happy. And it was everything but that. You know, it was chaotic. It was um, hurting me morally and ethically. And um, one particular time, I was in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, playing with the group, and um, one of the guys gave me a hallucinogenic drug, mm. and I had a negative reaction that almost took my life. Oh, wow. So as I was laying in bed, uh, my wife, Cindy, we were newly married in those days, 
uh, came up to me and said, uh, our life has to change. Hmm. If we don't change, you know, things are just going to get worse. And I, I was getting the signal from her that she was saying, you know, you're going to lose me because of what's going on in your life. And it was pretty bad, you know. So then at that point, we said, why don't we find something significant in life? Because we didn't know. Yeah, you know, we know we we wanted a change, but we didn't know what that means to have. You know, what do you do? So we went on a sort of a spiritual journey right away at the beginning. We went back to where we were raised in the church we were raised in, and it was sort of more the same. Mm. So we decided, uh, no, we're not going to stay there. And then I had a guy from the rock and roll world. To, to, he told me that I can uh, see his guru friend on Rush Street in downtown Chicago. So I went to see him. <clears throat> and, I, and my friend said, oh, yeah, if you go and see him, he'll tell you the meaning of life. And so I went and um, sat down in front of him. And I know what it means to be stoned. He was stoned out of his head. Oh. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out what am I going to learn from him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I sat there, and after a while, he talked to me, and he said, um, watch out for cats, man. And I said, watch out for cats. Why? He said, because cats will look into your eyes and they'll steal your soul. So I was pretty convinced that the cats looked into his eyes and stole his brain. <laughs> so I left. And um, we heard that a man in, in our condo complex taught the Bible. So we said, why don't we just ask him? He's a friendly man. His name is Mr. Theodore. That maybe he could help us. He came over and he met with us for a few weeks and uh, I asked him, what church do you go to? And he said, well, it's actually called the Kingdom Hall. It was a Jehovah Witness. Oh. <laughs> we didn't know, you know. Yeah. But we knew from our previous background, we were pretty much Trinitarian. We believed that Jesus was God, even though we weren't saved. Yeah. And, um, and he started saying, no, that isn't true. So we asked him not to come back because we thought that's not the right way. So I had kind of given up. I thought, well, this is life. You know, this is the life that I wanted. This is the life I now have. There's not much more I can do. And so um, she got a telephone call from her mother because there were some women coming through the neighborhood by her mother uh, who were inviting ladies to a Bible study. Class. Oh, wow. And they were from a good Bible-believing church. We didn't know anything about that. but So Cindy went to her mom's and talked with the ladies. And she went, started going um, on Thursday mornings to a Bible study. And they were studying the Gospel of John. Oh, wow. And as a result of that, Cindy came to a life-transforming relationship with Christ. And the problem I had is <clears throat> this woman now wants to go to church on Sunday morning. She wants to go to church on Sunday evening. <laughs> she wants to go to church on Wednesday night. And she wanted to go to the women's Bible study. So I sat her down and I said, I just need to know from you, do you love God more than you love me? Mm. And she said, yes, but because I love God the way I do, I love you in an entirely different and new way. And I said, well, that's it. I want to see your rabbi, guru, minister, priest, whatever he is. I didn't even know what to call him. And uh, she said, I'll, I'll make the appointment, but you've got to promise me that you won't embarrass me. Mm. So he came on a Tuesday night back in the day. You know, I answered the door and I went, peace, man. Because that's what we did. <laughs> and he that's said, awesome. He said, My kids still do that. <laughs> yeah. He said to me, one way. I said, what do you mean one way? He said, there's only one way to have peace. Mm. So he had this intriguing introduction to me right away. Anyways, we met for three and a half hours. And every time I asked him a question, he would take his Bible and he would turn it around and he'd say, what does it say here in the word of God? And it blew my mind, you know, because he never said, this is what I think, this is what my church thinks or what I believe. He would take the Bible, turn it around, and say, well, what does that passage say right there? The one that really blew my mind was Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Because in the religious system that I came from, uh, yes, you believed in Jesus' death and resurrection, but you had to cooperate with that. You had to do good things and receive sacraments and be a good person. And hopefully, maybe, 
you might make it someday into into heaven. But he was that passage was telling me that salvation was a free gift of God by his grace, and mm. it was not of works, lest anyone should boast. Right. And then it was a matter of faith, believing in the death and resurrection of Christ. That blew my mind. Because I kept on saying, you mean there's nothing else? And he kept on saying, no, Jesus did it all. Mm. He took your sin. He bore your penalty. Uh, if you will just trust in him for the salvation of your soul, you will be saved. And so... Um, at the end of the three and a half hours, you said, is there any, anything else, any questions you have? And I said, uh, no. And he said, um, well, he pulled me down. He said, well, come on. on. Could you, so he said, can you receive Christ tonight? And I said, I guess so. He grabbed me by the arm, pulled me down on, on, on my knees with him. He prayed a prayer and he told me what to pray. And, and the thing about my conversion, conversions are not always the same. You know, right, right. Okay. Some of them, some people will say, hey, I was saved this point, this date. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Others, um, you know, there's this thing of working out your salvation. Right. And so, you know, my wife would say that she grew up, always kind of believed God, but it wasn't in college when she got into a Bible study that really helped her right. identify some of those things. And so she said, you know, she would say, there's not a point, but I was saved through this period of time. Yeah. Um, yeah for I me. Say it's a, it's definitely a process. Yeah. yeah. For me. Yeah. For most was. people. I think it is a process. I think the overwhelming majority of people experience salvation through a process. Yeah. They interact with somebody who's a believer. They find out a little bit more information. Sometimes they debate the person yeah. because they've got an issue on their own heart. Well, in mine, my conversion was radical. Well, I think it's uh, fascinating, though, too, that you were seeking yeah. something yeah. And, and God revealed himself to you. That's right. you know? exactly right. I mean... It was, we were, d d both Cindy and I both definitely were looking for what is the real essence of life. Hmm. And we found out that you can never find anything eternal from that which is temporal. And everything in this life is temporal. Yeah. And it's only through Christ that you find something eternal. The treasures that you have in Christ last forever. So when it came to know Christ, one of the significant changes in my heart which I still have till this day, is an, an insatiable hunger for the Word of God. Oh, wow. It's almost been 50 years, and that's never changed. And then second of all, what's never changed is a strong desire for other people to understand the Bible. I'm passionate about understanding the Bible. That's why I can never read the Bible through in a year. It always takes me a couple of years because I can't let a passage go without me understanding it. So, so I can't just read over it. I have to stop. I'm the same way. I, I can, you know, like they do those one-year Bibles. Yeah. I've never, a one-year Bible is like four years for me. Like, <laughs> I, I, I finally stopped trying to do that. I just started like, what I do now is I, I go by, like right now I got a uh, ESV study Bible that, yeah. that has uh, margin notes. Like yeah, you can, yeah. uh, journal, it's a journal Bible and I can put my notes on there. Mm -hmm. But what I find is, is I will... I will will start that process, and I'll work through the Bible, and then I just start over <laughs> and work through. And so I've got like I'm starting to stack Bibles up that I've I've completed, mm -hmm. and uh, I figured well, maybe what I'll do one day is I'll have six of them, and I'll give you know kind of pick uh, pick one for each of my kids and give them my they can have one of my study Bibles with mm -hmm. all that highlights, notes, and stuff in there because I, I I I'm the same way. I just yeah. can't do that. That's I too can't much. Leave it. With, uh, you know, wondering what it means. I have to know what it means by what it says. So I'll go into the language and, I'll, you know, I'll look at a few commentaries because it just, it haunts me not to know what that passage means so by what it says. What would you say to someone if they came to you and they were like, Pastor Jerry, I don't understand any of this. I read it. I, these stories, they seem just out there. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't get it. What would you say to someone? Well, like I think that? a part of it is that where that person is as to whether or not they really have a relationship with Christ. Because in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14 says, The natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness to him. 
So, you know, if that's the condition, they have to get saved first. If they're truly saved, if they've come to know Christ, one of the mandates, the primary mandate that Christ gave to the church was to go into the world and make disciples, which means a student. And uh, what has to happen for a person like that, if they're saved, is someone has to come alongside and instruct them and teach them teach them what is called hermeneutics, the art and science of biblical interpretation. Teach them how to use commentaries so that they can understand them. Teach them to even write in a ledger, or a ledger, ledger, what is it? Ledger. Ledger. <laughs> you're okay. I'm thinking of legislation. No, you're yeah. fine. Yeah, just write in there, you know, the things that they have learned. So really, uh, on your own, this is a big task to take that Bible and to comprehend it accurately. The majority of people that come to know Christ simply, basically, at a basic level, understand the gospel. Uh, much of the other Christian doctrines, they may have some you know, portion of understanding, but they don't have a clear understanding. That's why Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples. The mistake the church has made is they thought he said, go into the world and get decisions. He didn't say that. He said, make disciples. Amen. And that's where that comes in. Somebody would need to help that person to understand it. And that's what, you know, Josh and others, anybody who's been in the faith for any time must always be willing to do that. They must be willing to take a person and at least help them to get a fundamental understanding of studying the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's a, yeah. absolutely. And, and, um, and I would even say you 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 said to, to make the, you know the decision versus disciples, and to be a fundamental issue. I would I would venture to say that is a, a big reason why we are where we're at in society because we got a lot of people who think they are saved or who um, uh, maybe they are saved but are just very very as Paul put it on the milk and never got off the milk and onto the meat of the word of God. You know they they they, they sit there and just you know they. they 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 could have the cake, but they just sit there and kind of toy at the end, you know. Like it's just it's just and, um, and the other thing that I thought took from there when you're talking about this unsatisfiable uh, uh, desire for God's word, I think that's every believer if you really are saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be. <clears throat> I, it, it's you know to me it's 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 fuel for my day. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I can always tell a bad day because the day I, a bad day is usually the day that I skip my 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 Bible time. If I'm so busy, I get into the day before I do my Bible time. Yeah, it's almost guaranteed to get off the the track and never get back on. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure. Like, uh, you know, when I find myself slacking in the Word, uh, I see bad habits come back. <laughs> yep. Oh yeah. And it's uh, it's frustrating, but you know, it's a reminder that we need this. Yeah. 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 We gravitate toward um, uh, what would what be described in the Bible as the world. The world is that ordered system of thinking with its uh, convoluted and twisted theology and perverted morality and values, our base nature, what Bi Paul describes as the flesh, gravitates toward that. So we have to have our, we have to have a cleansing of our minds almost every day. Yep. And, and the only thing that can do that is the word of God. Mm. Otherwise you did, you just naturally gravitate into the fleshly, uh, um, perspective of life, you know. Yeah. So. I, I I usually find, um, and, and you can tell me uh, what, you know, you've got a lot more experience in this than me. But when I talk to two believers who are struggling with sin or things like that, one of the first things I almost always identify is they're they're not having a personal time. Mm -hmm. They're not having a, a devotional time of with their spouse if they're married, and they're not, and their prayer life is either gone or not existent or. Um, or cookie cutter. That's right. At best, you know. And so, um, I, I always tell people, if you get on your knees and pray, that's a place of humility. I know it's weird in this society, but mm -hmm. the the knees show humility. Mm -hmm. If you're in God's word, it's get, it's correcting you, it's it sharpening is. you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then if you're spending time and taking that now to your wife, then you can end the end of your day. And so, you know, I don't, I don't know when you do your, everybody does time with their spouse at different times, but me and Amy do ours before we go to bed at night. We always read a devotional and pray. Um, and that's so key to us because, um, 
it's easy it's easy throughout the day to get caught up in a lot of stuff and you have to have that end point where you both come back together mm-hmm. and uh and that, that that's that, that that's that end point that i just brings my my night to peace no matter how weird or right off tracks my day can can get it's kind of god bringing that back together you know you start out you in that way you can kind of you know yeah. draw the line and so i I'd, I always find when I when I'm talking to men about that. Um, the other thing I usually find, you know, um, and I had this conversation in the past few days, which is um, a lot of people will say I, I, I get caught up in this or that, um, and I'll we'll start talking, and and it's something I think that in in modern church has been lost, which is understanding our enemy. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I go. You've got God's word. I said, Have you ever done a study of Satan? Through God's word, not 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 in the world's sense to say, but what does God's word say about our enemy? Mm-hmm. And uh, this conversation, I, I literally had this conversation yesterday with the with the gal. She was saying, "Hey, I I I've been finding myself getting really caught up and you know getting upset with the other side politically and all the stuff because all this bad stuff is occurring." I said, "Well, let's take a step back and let's look at a couple things biblically. First of all, we know the world's going to get bad." I said, "My co-host on the podcast, Scott, is always good to remind me about that. We know that it's going to get wor- worse. That that's we just know that. Mm-hmm. So you need to keep that in the back of your mind." But I said, "The other part is is realize that those people are not your enemy. Mm-hmm. No. Your enemy is manipulating them. They're the puppets. You're upset with the puppet master. Mm-hmm. He's manipulative. He doesn't create." Um, and he lies and he deceives. And I said, you need to understand his game plan. And if you understand his game plan, it'll not only help you under- get past looking at the person in front of you and realizing that it's the person pulling the strings, it's Satan. But then I said, also, it'll help you understand how you can better reach that person. Mm-hmm. And uh, Quite and, true. And so. There are certain spiritual disciplines that people have to learn how to practice in life. Mm. You mentioned one, it's being in the Word of God every day. You said the same and in prayer, yeah. and that is a priority. I think it's important that you um, establish mutually edifying relationships, spiritually advantageous relationships with other believers that you can interact with concerning your, your life, your day-to-day. Journey. You mean like like mentors and discipling, like we were sure, just talking sure. about, and also like Jesus died for the body of Christ, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. so he calls it his bride? I mean, Yeah, I'm, yeah. but in that context of the body of Christ, you you know, if you can find relationships that are uh, helpful or advantageous mm. to your spiritual growth, yeah, that's very important. And then, of course, uh, making a practice of corporate worship, you only get a chance to do that once a week with the body of Christ. That should be a priority mm. so that you can hear the word of God proclaimed. And the reason for that, the reason that preaching as a part of a service on a Sunday is so that you can comprehend the scripture Mm. so that you can apply the scripture because one of the greatest acts of worship is not singing. It's the application of truth to your life. Amen. That's worship. Yeah. And so you learn from the preaching how you should conduct yourself, how you should think, the values that you should have, um, get doctrinal precision and stuff like that. But uh, that's a priority to be in corporate worship and then gift-related service, taking your gifts and exercising your gifts in the body of Christ. That's a very important spiritual discipline. It helps you grow. You can't substitute that with everything else. Right. In other words, you can't say, well, I'm going to just serve in the church, but not pay attention to reading scripture, not paying attention to priority of prayer, you know, spiritual advantageous relationship. And then, of course, um, one of the things that you need to do if you really want to grow is be able to give a good witness. Mm. I mean, not everybody's an evangelist. There's some people, I have a friend, I mean, he is an evangelist. If your chest is going up and down, he's going to preach the gospel to you. (laughs) You know, that's the kind of guy he is. But that's his heart. That's his whole passion for life. But the one thing all of us are, are a witness. And right. all you have to do is share your story. How is it that you came to know Christ? And that in itself can be very powerful to people, more meaningful than a pastor in the pulpit. Yeah, all I know is I met this guy, he spit yeah. mud in my eyes, and now I see. <laughs> That's right. I don't, know any, I don't know anything else except for I was once lost, I was blind, I couldn't see, and now I see. 
I was a rock and roll musician. Next thing you know, I'm sitting in Moody studying theology. <laughs> How'd that happen? <laughs> exactly. You know, it's, it's awesome how God, once you come into a relationship with him, he seems to just radically shift the, the whole trajectory of your life. And, and yet it's more fulfilled and you have more meaning than, than you could ever have imagined. Ever imagined yeah. So what would you say to somebody who says, well, I believe in Christ. I believe Christ died for our sins but doesn't have that relationship with Christ. Yeah, there are a lot of And people, doesn't understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times what people mean by, yeah, I believe in Christ, is more of an intellectual awareness of who Jesus is and what he had done. Um, the, the reformers, when they used to define what faith is, they would say faith has three parts to it. The first is, you know, acknowledging uh, the gospel facts that Christ came into the world, Christ uh, died to you know redeem us, and acknowledging those facts. But that doesn't save you. Just knowing those facts doesn't save you. And then there's even an affirmation. So not only do I acknowledge the facts of the gospel message in Jesus, I even affirm it to be true. But that's still not saving faith. Saving faith occurs when the person willfully and intentionally trust only in the death and resurrection of Christ to save him. So you can live a long time declaring yourself to be a Christian, and literally you are 12 inches away from heaven because it's 12 inches from your head to your heart. But you're away because you got it here, but you haven't got it here. And there are people in that condition. I've met a lot of them. They've been raised in churches. That's the most dangerous one. Uh, the person who's been so familiar with the truth of the gospel that the truth of the gospel has lost its cutting edge in their life. Mm. You know, it just doesn't, it's just information. There's no heart engaged, no will. There's an intellect, emotion, and will. That's the attributes of personality. And all three have to be engaged to be saved. Yeah. And there's some people that know about the truth will tell you they even believe the truth, but when you look at their lifestyle, it's no different than anybody else's lifestyle. When you look at their values, it's the same thing. There's no difference between them and, let's say, an unsaved person. That generally is a person who intellectually has understood the facts, but he's not entrusting the salvation of a soul to Christ. And so that's probably where I would begin with a person like that. I want to make sure that they really have that real relationship. The real relationship doesn't come from knowing, it's knowing stuff. But they got to want that too, though, correct? They got to want it. They, yeah, yeah, you got to, you can't know, you can't change right. if you don't know. So the, the, the knowing has to be kind of the first step, right? You can't, sure. you have to share the gospel, right? So they, but once they hear it, then they've got to intellectually re go through the brain. And then as he said, it's got to make its way to the heart. And in the heart, the heart is where you bow your knee. Because you, yeah. you can live a good life or be a good person on your own, right? Mm -hmm. But you can still not bow your, your knee to the, to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's, that, that can only be done in the heart. And once that done, that's done, not only do you live a good life, but now you're passionate about the things that, are God, that God is passionate about. Right. Right. And so often what I find is people who live those good lives, they can be good moral people, but they probably never share the gospel because they don't have the heart for Christ. They don't. Uh, the other thing that I always remind people of is you'll never turn to the good news in faith unless you fully understand the bad news. Mm. And the bad news, and that's where people really should wrestle with what the Word of God says. The bad news is that all of us are sinners. Every one of us enter this world, we're sinners by nature and by practice, and we have uh, the sin of Adam imputed to us. It's on us. So we are sinners. We are lost sinners. And that, is, that produces spiritual death. That, that's what makes people indifferent and even hostile to God, is they're dead spiritually. Mm. And until a person understands that they're a sinner who needs to be saved, and they can't save themselves. I've shared the gospel with people and they'll say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going to go to church or I'm gonna <laughs> try to start being nicer to my wife or my kids or whatever it is. And I have to remind them that that's not the formula that God gives us in the scripture for being saved. 
There's no place in the Bible where he says, if you're better to your wife, better to the dog, to the kids, I might let you into my kingdom. You're a wretched sinner. You're mm. separated from God. And the only way is his way to get that fixed. And that means repenting. Repentance is a word that it doesn't often get uh, understood. It comes from the Greek word mataneo. It means uh, literally a radical change of your mind, a radical change of thinking. But it also implies you're turning away from your sinful life and you're turning to God. And you're turning to him to save you from your soul, uh, from your sins. And so it's important that we understand nobody's going to turn to the good news unless they really understand the bad news. Mm. So usually when I begin a gospel presentation, I begin with the bad news. Yeah. I need to make sure that they understand why they need the good news. Because you could tell people, you know, come to Jesus and you'll go to heaven. Yeah, okay. You know, I don't, I don't even know if I need heaven. <laughs> What's the other option, you know? Right. You know, so you got to make sure they understand it. And the consequences of dying in your sins is eternal damnation in the lake of fire. Yeah. But yeah. more important, Unfortunately, today's society, they put that out there like that's a cool thing. Yeah, that, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, the one thing that I have to tip my hat to Satan is he has succeeded in making righteousness strange and sin normal. He's done a great job of that. Well, and, and I would even say the picture of hell. You know, they've, they've depicted hell like they want it to be, but, but hell is not just a, a, a lake of fire. Yeah. But hell is a picture, uh, to give some clarification, mm -hmm. hell was actually the place where all the manure and pee and everything, and it was like the, the dumpster that was below a, a city. Mm -hmm. That's where the lepers hung out. So you had disease. You had crud, you had burning, right? Because you got all that stuff. It's like being at a, uh, a dumpster where there's a fire underneath. You got an, uh, a smell that's un, uh, unrecognizable. I mean, there's no way to describe it. <clears throat> so it's not just that you're burning in a lake of fire, but it's the other things that are around it. The picture that, that we get is 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 not a... <laughs> Not, not, it's not like, hey, it's just going to be a hot there and I, and it just won't, you know, it'd be like a hot day in, in the, uh, around the equator. No, no, this is, your flesh is burning. Okay. There's disease. It's, it's, it's got a stench to it. It's, it's not going to be a, uh, I think that Satan has done a really good job of the man with the red pitchfork and, yeah. and making it, make it look like it's just, you know, oh, this place of fire, you know, well, and like the cartoons or whatever say, but no, it's, it's. You know, you want to kind of get the, the close of a picture as we can get to hell, go find a dumpster, go up to North County where that fire is burning in that dumpster and uh, throw a bunch of manure, get some diseased people around there. And then now, now you start to get a picture of what that'll be like and a little bit. I think the essence of it too is you're eternally separated from God. Mm. That's the worst part of it. There's no more um, possibility of reconciling to God, mm. which is a terrible thing. And it never gets any better. There's no hope of a better day in hell. You know, that's a terrible thing. It's Absolutely. like the old beer, beer commercial. Doesn't, what is it? Doesn't get any better than this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's true. What city is that in where that, that's burning right now? Is that? That's up in North County. We're going to, I'm working on getting uh, the activist who has kind of been behind that. Her room uh, is a friend of mine. So we're, we're working on getting that. She had the documentary Atomic Homefront that they did on her. So she's going to be in here. She was supposed to be in here a couple of weeks ago, but then there's been a bunch of legislation in Missouri. There's been a lot of movement, so she's kind of had to pause that. There's a place in Israel called Gehenna, and uh, it is a dump is what it is. And many times people think of that in reference to the concept of hell. Yeah. Yeah, well, interesting stuff. Uh, with that said, we want to thank you for joining us. Uh, don't forget to continue to, to like and subscribe on our episodes. Uh, that helps us. Uh, get the word out and get people to, to hear about great uh, teaching, uh, great conversations. And uh, uh, until next time, you have a great one. I'll do the Scott thing.
you're safe.